Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we have the privilege of delving into some profound and intriguing mysteries at the forefront of human understanding. Together, we're going to journey to the cosmic landscape where gravity, dark energy, and the very fabric of space entwine and enfold, yielding the possibility of stunning astrophysical phenomenon. By way of background, our story begins with a shift in our understanding of the force of gravity, which took place around the early decades of the 20th century. Isaac Newton's universal law of gravity, which had stood unchallenged for centuries, was radically superseded by Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. Now, while the observational differences between Einstein's and Newton's theories, they are minuscule in familiar settings, Einstein's theory was not just a minor update of Newton's. It was a complete overhaul, revealing a new way of thinking about gravity, not as a force, as we are all taught in high school, but instead as the curvature of space-time itself. Yet, even Einstein, the revolutionary thinker, the unmatched architect of humankind's edifice of understanding, even Einstein himself grappled with accepting all the implications of his own general theory of relativity. Einstein, he struggled, at least at first, with the idea of an expanding universe, even though it is a direct consequence of the most basic version of his equations. Einstein struggled with the idea of black holes, again, even though black holes are also a direct consequence of his equations. Einstein struggled to accept the possibility of gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space-time itself. And finally, of particular relevance to our discussion here tonight, Einstein introduced but then abandoned the idea of a cosmological constant. That's an invisible energy suffusing space an idea that in recent decades has roared back into the mainstream of cosmological research in the guise of what we now call dark energy. Even so, even though many physicists and astronomers are convinced that the universe is filled with dark energy, we are still largely in the dark about the true nature of dark energy. What exactly is dark energy made of? What are its detailed properties? Is it truly constant? or does the dark energy change over time? We have been asking these very questions for some time and have been coming up empty-handed. However, new breakthroughs in observational astronomy and experimental physics, including the detection of gravitational waves, are offering us new tools to probe this mystery. In the spirit of beyond Einstein, although Einstein himself was skeptical that gravitational waves would ever be detected, here we are, not only having detected them, but now, as we will discuss, using them to understand dark energy through a beautiful concept known as gravitational rainbows. The idea posits that gravitational waves, while moving through the dark energy, might split into component frequencies analogous to light forming rainbows as it passes through the residual mist after a rainfall. Is there a pot of gold, a treasure trove of new insights to be found by chasing gravitational rainbows? That's a question we will discuss in this chapter of the story with our first guest, Claudia Duram. And let us begin with our first conversation with Claudia Duram who is a professor of theoretical physics at Imperial College London and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She researches gravity, particle physics, cosmology, seeking the fundamental laws of the universe. So, Claudia, I thought that what we begin with as this chapter describes the dark side, I'd like us to get to this idea of dark energy, which is a, a vital part of our thinking about the cosmos right now. And toward the end, we'll get to the work that you're doing, which is trying to, in a way, probe the dark energy, almost using the dark energy as a tool to gain insight into deeper understanding of the force of gravity. But to get there, let's wind back in time and just think about gravity 
in the early stages of our species' attempt to understand it, which of course brings in Isaac Newton, who gave the world the first description of gravity, which does a, a pretty good job, right? It's amazing. Even today we use Newton's laws to describe most of the universe, most of what's going on in the solar system. It works impeccably, apart from a little tweaks here and there. And so if, it, if, if Newton does such a good job at describing the kinds of things that we see, what motivated Einstein to try to go further? So there were different developments that happened at the end of the 20th century. Um, one thing that was clear already from Newton's perspective was the force of gravity as he described it was instantaneous. So that means that um, as soon as something pops up in existence, it would affect the whole universe around it. And already Newton realized that this can't be right. It, it, it can't just happen like that. He didn't know about special relativity. He didn't know about the fact that information has to travel at most at the speed of light. But he, he knew already that it didn't, it didn't make sense. So that was already some theoretical preconception that said it can't be the ultimate theory of everything. And one way of quickly seeing that, just because we happen to have Newton's equation on the board, is if you change one of the masses in that formula that we teach to high school kids around the world, the force of attraction between them changes instantaneously. There's no That's time right. delay in that, in that formula. That's right, exactly. So he knew already at the time that it, it had to have something else beyond Newton's theory of, of gravity. But what exactly? No one knew. And then centuries went by, really centuries went by, uh, where Newton laws of gravity were, were just miraculous. They, they were matching everything, including the laws of gravity in the, in the solar system. Yeah. Up to a point where as they, they could go along and predict the presence of new planets in the solar system, just based on looking at the motion of known planets and, and understanding how from according to Newton's theory of gravity, um, there needed to be other masses there to explain the motion of all the planets. And, and was so that that's Neptune? A, Neptune was that? That, I mean, that, exactly, don't know if my exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. So Neptune was, was uh, um, just predicted before it was in observed uh, using Newton's laws of gravity. And then the same thing happened with, with Mercury. They were looking at the orbits of Mercury and just by looking at, at how it orbited around the sun, accounted for all the other motions in the sol of the, all the other masses in the solar system, yeah. Jupiter, the Earth, and everything else, um, they could predict that there had to be something else there to explain the motion of Mercury um, uh, in the solar system. And so they predicted the existence of a new planet. Vulcan. Vulcan, and it was observed. Hmm. Have you seen Vulcan in the sky? It was observed. Um, it, it wasn't true. And now we know that the, the, what explains the motion of Mercury to an impeccable precision is not a new planet. It's, it's something new, but it's something new in the laws of gravity. But you that know? raises a beautiful point right there, because sometimes an anomalous observation suggests that there's something different out there. That's sometimes right. an that's anomalous right. observation means there's something wrong with our theory. That's right, that's right. And, and sometimes we don't know. And sometimes it's much of a muchness. Is this something new, new with gravity? Or is what is new in gravity actually a new substance? And, and as we'll see with dark energy, sometimes the two are very much aligned with one another. It's, it's really something new in understanding of the world that, that surrounds us. So Einstein certainly came to the conclusion that the law of gravity that Newton wrote down needed a revision. Exactly. And, and he spends, what, like 10 years trying to come up with a new description of gravity that will match all the experimental data, but not have this instantaneous action at a distance, That's which right. was Newton's That's right. problem. That's right. So already from 1905, from special relativity, then it was clear that nothing could travel faster than light. So there it was set in stone that gravity itself, or the laws of gravity, couldn't travel faster than light, than the speed of light. Um, and it took him 10 years, between 1905 and 1915, to really understand that not only there was a unification of space and time, as is the case in uh, special relativity, but it's even more fundamental than that. It's, it's not only space and time, it's space and time of matter and energy and everything, really everything you can imagine, they have to be reconciled together and affect the very notion of space-time. Yeah. So it's an understanding of Einstein's theory of general relativity in, in 1915 
to, to see that gravity is a concept that can be thought as a force, and it's useful to think of it as a force in, in most of the contexts, but more fundamentally, it can be thought as really the curvature of space-time and our motion in this cur space, um, cur curved space-time around us. So we understand now from Einstein's theory of general relativity that if we feel the effect of the sun, for instance, in the solar system, it's because we live in a space-time and the sun curve the structure of space-time around itself. And us, as inhabitants of space-time, we feel this curvature and the way we go about in everyday life is in adapting for the curvature of, of, of space-time. And then what we're looking at right here is kind of a familiar image, I think, to many people who follow science, this warping of the environment around the sun. This is, though, a 2D version that we often use because it's a little easier to understand. But if we can bring up just for giggles, the 3D version. So this is somewhat closer to the vision that Einstein gives, right? That any massive body, merely by virtue of being there in space, has this impact on the environment. That's right, that's right. And if we put our false eye on, we could see that in, in 4D space-time with the notion of time itself. And accommodating for time is really very fundamental in Einstein's laws of, of general relativity. And one thing maybe we can see in an animation, I don't know, but um, we can see now in Einstein's theory of general relativity that if you add a mass, or if you were to take out the sun from the solar system, all of us, I'm a theorist, so I can do that. <laughs> You'll see, our observers can, can do that. But if you were to take the sun out of the, the solar system for a second, it would take some time for the structure of space to adapt to that and to propagate that information to the yeah. planets in the solar system. Which would it's, fix the problem that, that we have exactly, with Newton's exactly. description. Um, so, so this is around 19... 15-ish, Einstein writes down the final form of the field equations. I think it was November 25th, 1915 at the Prussian Academy of Sciences. And, and so people then slowly start to apply Einstein's new description of gravity to various things. One such thing is the universe as a whole, right? Trying to see what Einstein tells us. So just sort of a thumbnail sketch. Where did we go or where did scientists go in applying Einstein's ideas cosmologically? So one thing that they, people knew already at the time is that we are made out of lots of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And from Einstein's theory of general relativity, anything affects space-time. Even light will affect space-time. Anything made out of energy, pressure, it will have an effect on the structure of space-time around, uh, around itself. Uh, so Einstein himself realized that if there's all of this stuff present in the universe, it's not going to make the universe stand still. The universe is going to want to adapt to it and to evolve. And so if you just have one mass, like the sun, present at some point locally, it wraps the structure of space-time around itself locally. But if you think of the whole universe, it's not just one localized mass here or there, it's everywhere. Everywhere there's some dust, there's some radiation, there's some clusters of galaxies. And so it doesn't have an effect on the universe, which is just to wrap space around itself, but it has to be something which is global throughout the universe. And what Einstein understood is that, and, and his colleagues, is that it will lead to an expansion of the universe. The universe is not going to stand still. It's going to want to evolve. The, the, the fabric of space-time is going to be stretching through the effect of everything present in, in the universe. And so that led to the idea that through the existence of all the, the matter in the universe, the universe should be expanding. Uh, and and we, this is what later has been observed. But at the time, people didn't think that the universe was something which was time-dependent and evolving. And so to, to counter that, Einstein thought, well, maybe we have to add something. Add something not in terms of matter, because we have matter there that leads to an evolution of the universe, but we have to compensate that in Einstein's laws of general relativity by adding a cosmological constant that would counteract the effect of everything else in the universe. Which would be kind of an outward push to... That's right, yeah. that's right, that's right, that's right. And, and so, I mean, just for the people who want to see that there's math behind this, I mean, if we bring up Einstein's 
equation just for a moment, the more pure, simple version that doesn't have this quality that would help stabilize the universe this is a beautiful equation. That's what Einstein writes down. But then, as you're saying, in order to kind of stabilize the universe, right, to keep it from, you know, expanding, you've got this other term that he adds in. It's that lambda. That's the famous cosmological constant. And in the history of science, by 1929, when finally Edwin Hubble reveals that the universe is expanding, Einstein rues the day that he introduced the cosmological constant because it was meant to yield a static universe, kind of slaps himself in the forehead and says, this is the greatest blunder of my life. Exactly, exactly. And probably that was one strike of genius of his, because we'll see, he will come back. And, and today we do believe this, this cosmological constant or something very close to that has, has to be there. Well, let's do that. So, so this is, you know, way back in the 1930s, a lot of thought and investigation happens in the intervening decades, but I want to jump ahead to the very modern result, which happened, you know, in the late 1990s, where the expectation was that the universe is expanding, but it would be expanding slower and slower, because right. after right. all, even right. in Einstein, gravity is something that pulls inward, at least the gravity is associated with ordinary things like stars and planets. What happened in 1998 with this expectation? So, so if the universe is expanding slower and slower, that means when you look further and further away, you look more and more in the past. And that means that in the past, things were, ex uh, were expanding faster than it is today. Um, and so there were different missions looking for explosion of stars, supernovae, that would allow us to understand how in the past the universe was expanding with the expectation that it was expanding faster the further away you look, because in the past it, was, it would have been faster. And people were really going, trying to, to converge towards this uh, observation. And 1999, that's right, roughly. Yeah, eight or nine. Yeah. yeah, two groups realized that precisely the opposite was happening. As you go and look further in the past, what you see is the expansion of the universe was going slower as compared to what it is today. So it means that today the expansion of the universe is growing faster than it was in the past. The, the, the gravitational pull is not making the universe expansion go slower, it's making it go faster. So the galaxies as we see here are just rushing apart and faster right. and faster. That's right, over the expansion time. of the universe is, is accelerating. And so something m must be driving this accelerated expansion of the universe. And, and we can call that something dark energy, we can call it whatever we want. But, but calling it something doesn't mean that we know what it is. It's just a placeholder for, 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 for a lack of knowledge, for a lack of understanding of what, what is going on in the universe. Why? And it is a version of that idea that exactly. Einstein put exactly. forward and, and then retracted. So, so what do you think the dark energy is? And by you, I mean the broad <laughs> physics community. That, that's, that's a good question. The, we, the reality is we don't know. We can call it lambda as a cosmological constant. It has to be something very close to a cosmological constant. So, so we have very good, by now, observational um, evidence that it's there. There's no debate that something must be driving the accelerated expansion of the universe. And w we have more and more evidence of what it's not. But it has, what it is has to be, look very much like this cosmological constant or this lambda term that Einstein put in into, into his equation. But, but where it comes from, that, that's a matter of, of debate. W one, one aspect that, that we know as physicists is that there must be some vacuum energy. And by that, I mean, if, if you look all around yourself, we, we, we're made out of classical matter, but at the more fundamental level, we're made out of particles which are quantum in nature. The world is quantum. And so bubbling in and out of existence everywhere, not only in the solar system, but everywhere in the whole structure of space time, there's some quantum fluctuations. I we see it here, I That's guess. That's right. Yep. And, and so this is made out of, the, this has some energy density. It, it is, a vacuum energy, and it's everywhere. It's not only in the inhabitable regions of the universe, it's really everywhere. And so it is a constant. It's been a constant in space, and it is a constant in time, and so it is a cosmological constant. But it's when we calculate it, this with our best understanding of quantum physics, that, what size of the energy 
do these ripples seem to give rise yeah, to? Yeah, this is where the fun part comes in. <laughs> <laughs> so in principle, everything works well, right? We have a vacuum energy that looks like a cosmological constant that drives the acceleration of the universe. We all set. We, we just need to do a few calculations sometimes. So if I just by myself on known physics, we know electrons this live in the universe. That's not a matter of debate. We now know the Higgs field is present. The, Higgs, the contribution to the Higgs field, to the vacuum energy, is 56 orders of magnitude larger as compared to what we would need as an amount of dark energy or cosmological constant to explain observations. The accelerated expansion. The accelerated expansion yeah. of the universe. 56 orders of magnitude too large. And, and this is really an issue because we, we have far too much of it. If we didn't have enough of it, it would be fine. We'd say, well, there's more of it than maybe there's other more massive particles we haven't observed yet. And once we observe them, they may lead to a contribution to um, the accelerated expansion of the universe. But here we, we really are too much of a good thing. And, and, and this is the biggest discrepancy in the whole history of, of, of physics. Yes. 56 orders of magnitude with known physics. And, and if I imagine that there could be contributions beyond the standard model particles, beyond the Higgs, we could go up to a discrepancy of 120 orders of magnitude. This is just insane. It's, it's orders of magnitude. If I just consider the Higgs contribution to the vacuum energy, it would make the universe accelerate so fast that it would just be a centimeter in size. The whole universe, I couldn't be able to see beyond a centimeter. Because everything else would be rushing away faster than the speed That's of light, right. you wouldn't be That's able to right. see it. That's yeah. right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So you, as a theorist, have been investigating ways that, at least in principle, we might be able to probe the dark energy, see the, dark, the effect of dark energy and other things that we can more directly measure exactly. to try to get some insight. Exactly. So can you give us a, f a feel for what it is that you're doing? So what, one of the things we will try to do is, is just imagine it, it's, it's a rainy day and then there's a little bit of sunlight and you see a rainbow in the sky. And from the rainbow, just the fact that light went through droplets of water in the sky you can see the splitting of the different colors. And just by seeing this rainbow, you know that there's this droplets of water in the sky. Now, this is an analogy. And here's an album <laughs> cover that kind of is uh, <laughs> good to uh, illustrate that point. <laughs> exactly. Now we want to do the same thing. And, and it's not just pop culture. It's actually something we can, we can try to do with gravitational waves. So dark energy, what, one thing we know is that it's not something we're going to interact very easily in our everyday life. We, we probably know it's there all around us, but we're not, we're not directly interacting with it. And so to see it, if it were, we need to use gravity. We need to use the analog of light, which is gravitational waves. So let me just quickly show, just I'm sure people are familiar with it, but you know, we now know since 2015 that if masses are moving within the fabric of space, they can jostle it, sending out these gravitational waves. And just as another footnote, Einstein himself thought about gravitational waves, and again, it was one of the ideas that he ultimately resisted. So again, we've gone beyond Einstein. These have now been detected, but you are proposing to use gravitational waves as a means of probing this, this dark energy. That's right. Einstein. As gravitational waves propagate through space-time, they may interact with dark energy because dark energy is everywhere. And just like shining light through clouds leads to a rainbow, shining gravitational waves through the dark energy, through the clouds, the dark energy clouds of the universe, may lead to gravitational wave rainbows. So they may be gravity rainbows. As we look at gravitational waves of different colors, of different frequencies, we may see that they propagate in a slightly different ways. And so right now with LIGO in 2015, and since then we observe gravitational waves at around 100 hertz fre frequency. So, so these are not the real colors, it's just an analogy. So where's that on? So that picture? would be on your very right. Right. So towards the red. Yep. Uh, sorry, it's Toward in, the... Uh, towards the... Yeah, it's on your very right, towards the, the violet. So it's, it's relatively high frequency for gravitational waves. But as we have more and more missions going to space and, and using even possibly stars themselves as our detectors for gravitational waves, we're hoping to go towards lower and lower frequencies or to more and more towards the red color. 
And as we see the evolution of gravitational waves when they go through our space-time, through our universe at different colors, we may see that there's a small shift in the way they evolve, which would look like, in some sense, a gravitational rainbow, hmm. the analog of a rainbow before gravitational waves. And so that's why it's so important to being able, for instance, with the Simon Observatory, to look at gravitational waves at as low frequency, as red color, if you want, as possible. The frequency of those gravitational waves, they, 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 the, the wavelength of those gravitational waves are almost as large as the whole observable universe. Wow. They're as, as large as it can be. And just by probing how different colors of gravitational waves evolve differently, we may have an insight of how gravity behaves and how gravity interacts with dark energy as they propagate through the universe. It's so a beautiful, that's a beautiful idea. We just have a couple minutes. I just want to end with one other idea that you've been pursuing, which again extends Einstein, because you've been investigating the possibility that much as light has, people no doubt have heard, you know, two independent polarizations, you that's know, right. it can that's oscillate right. this that's way right. or that way. Gravitational waves also have a similar quality in the traditional standard Einsteinian description, but you've been studying the possibility that maybe in other versions that extend Einstein, the different polarizations may number more than just two. That's Can you just right. give a exactly. feel for that? Yeah. Exactly. So this, this is a picture of what light, the two polarizations of light, and, and we have very good proof of that. And there's a direct analogy for gravitational waves that we may see. I don't know if there's another slide. Yeah, if you can bring that. up uh, that other video, please. Yep, great. So on your, on your left are the gravitational waves polarization that have been observed with LIGO for, for for gravitational waves. But in principle, there could be more to it. There could be more flavor of gravitational waves, some that we haven't observed. And they may be quite shy, but they may be present. And so as we probe our understanding of gravitational waves, and as we try to probe them in different ways, using different instruments or different uh, realizations, we may see that there is, could be more to gravity or, or is more to gravity. And that, in some sense, could either be the effect of dark energy on gravity, or it could be gravity way of mimicking dark energy. And, and sometimes the two are much of a muchness. They are embedded into the same concepts. So both experiment and theory sort of maybe blending together in exactly. a powerful way. Exactly. Fascinating work. So unfortunately our time is, is up and limited, but please join me in thanking Claudia Thank Durand. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. I can't help but think that were Einstein in the audience for this conversation, he would now be smiling. Two ideas that come straight out of his own general theory of relativity, the cosmological constant or dark energy, as well as ripples in the fabric of space, gravitational waves, neither of which he was, shall we say, leaning toward in his own lifetime. They are now at the forefront of our understanding, are believed to be bona fide features of reality, and as we just heard, may well come together in the stunning idea of gravitational rainbows, the, the dark energy acting as a kind of prism, splitting gravitational waves into their component frequencies, the analog of colors for light or pure tones for sound. That would indeed be something that would make Einstein proud. All right, the next conversation in this Beyond Einstein series will take up another implication of general relativity that Einstein resisted, the idea of black holes, a possibility that over the years has shifted from unlikely to possible to likely, and now with recent observations to absolutely certain. We will talk to some of the very scientists responsible for that final shift into certainty and explore what's on the horizon of black hole research. Join me for part two of this series, my conversation with Erin Kara and Shep Doleman.